Good afternoon. I know it's been a long day. Uh, this is the fifth year we've done this here at the Tocqueville Chateau. <clears throat> and intermittently, we have made references to Alexi de Tocqueville over the years. This is the first time in five years where we're going to try to do something brief but systematic uh, to try to, uh, to raise, raise the question here, might he be, might Alexi be the, the great survivor of the 19th century? Uh, I tell my students after teaching 35 years that we're still wrestling with ideas that emerged from 1750 to 1850. We think it's over, but in fact, it's not. And I've, I've probably taught democracy in America 120 times. Uh, and I have reached conclusion at my age that he is the, the lone survivor of the 19th century. And more than that, he is the prophet for the 21st, 22nd, and 23rd century. And I want to briefly lay this out in five or six minutes, which I know is quite crazy. Uh, we're in the business as human beings of solving problems. And much of this conference is about clarifying the question so that we can solve the problem of the Russia-Ukraine war. But, but what we lack, what we sorely lack, is a vision. We don't have an orientation for the 21st century that allows us to think clearly about what we're, up, what we're up against and about the long thread of history that we are involved in. And Tocqueville saw it in 1835, and his vision has not been surpassed. And I tell my friends on the left and on the right that he is the singular figure that helps us to understand almost everything that is transpiring before us. We like to think that there was a great big break after 1989, and perhaps we're in a new stage of history now. I'm not clear about that. I'm not convinced in the least. I think Tocqueville saw in 1835 everything that we have been talking about. He said democracy is coming, but we have to be very careful about what that term means. On occasion, he means by democracy, politics. But what he really says most, most often is that democracy means a change in social conditions. And so democratic social conditions, and you, you can confirm this with your own experience, are ones that, that take this form. We can be members of a different class, a different culture, a different linguistic group. <clears throat> but what Tocqueville think, thinks uniquely characterizes the democratic age is that we can look into each other's eyes and see a person. And you will say, of course, and he will say, no, 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 this is an extraordinary historical achievement that could not have really been attained in an aristocratic world where everybody looks inside their own class and, is, and, and other people are almost invisible. And so the central understanding that he's giving us is the democratic age brings about something new, which is recognition of other persons, but there's a corollary, which is when we recognize other people, we also recognize the suffering of other people. The suffering of other people becomes visible in the way that heretofore it hadn't been. In 1989, I, I read the, the full book, but I read the author's introduction for the first time in earnest. It's 11 pages long. It took me three and a half hours to read it. I closed the book. And I said, you will spend the rest of your life with this book. And I have. The last sentence he gives us in the author's introduction is the following. While the parties are busying themselves with tomorrow, I have tried to see the whole of the future. And what he understood in 1835 was that there were two, two groups that were likely going to prevail or, or present themselves as coherent alternatives going forward, and both of them would be deeply dangerous. On the left would be the party of revolution, and by that I mean the party that continually wants to undo everything that has been made. And there have been three distinct waves. I'll qualify with the French Revolution, but Marxism was the second, what Tocqueville would call an incomplete religion, 
And I do believe, and this is not the topic for this subject, this conversation, but identity politics is probably the third one. The, to abolish this current state of things, this is the way Marx put it. This is a great temptation always. But then there's the party of the right, which is equally dangerous. And that is the party that wished to re-enchant the world, to go back. And this can take the form of ISIS or Al-Qaeda or uh, a greater Russia, if you will, eternal Russia. Uh, in America, it takes the form on the right increasingly of, of an integralist movement or even a Nietzschean movement. There's always a temptation to go back and to re-enchant the world. So Tocqueville sought to find a middle way, but he also knew there would be a tremendous temptation to go down these two different roads. And the implication of that is there will never be a post-war world. Because he thought that for the next 500 years, you would have these two movements, both of them attacking the present order with all of its complexities, with all of its lack of parsimony. These, these two movements on the right and the left would offer a promise to redeem the world. And Tocqueville's point was, if we believe in this liberal world order, we have to understand its extraordinary messiness, its lack of parsimony, and we have to hang in there with it and never give up on it. So our task today, then, he would say, is to push back against uh, re-enchantment movements and revolu revolutionary mo movements to maintain some semblance of history with an understanding that we're also moving forward and that it's really difficult to negotiate this movement toward the democratic era, and again, I repeat, by, by that he meant that with each passing generation, we would recognize each other more and more. And I've taught for 15 years in the Middle East, and I've seen this. It's not just social relations. It's not just fixed classes. You see this among your children and your grandchildren. We're, we're treating each other much more informally. All the apparatus that keeps people separate from one another in the form of their roles is disappearing. This is the long-term movement of history which Tocqueville saw very clearly, but he saw that it was really tempting also to collapse into ourselves. And this is the problem of individualism, which he thought was, was the greatest threat. Tocqueville's simple social theory is this, and we must always remember it. We're moving from what he called the aristocratic age to the democratic age. In the aristocratic age, you have the one, the few, and the many. And as you move into the democratic age, you will have the one, it will no longer be the king, it will be the state, you will have the many, now understood as citizens. But his great question is, what will stand between the one and the many? And Tocqueville is remarkable. At the beginning of democracy in America, he seems very hopeful. And then he spent five years up in that library. And he thought very, very deeply. And volume two is a much deeper book. I tell my students that if you read volume two, it will be as if he took your skull, peeled it back, and looked inside your brain. And you will say to yourself, how could he know that about me? But what he understood was, as year went by, as decades went by, we would slowly become more and more isolated and alone. I think Tocqueville had a view that the natural human condition is manic depression or bipolarity. We are now a medicated world, especially you young people. We're told that this is a brain chemistry problem. I'm here to tell you that in 1835, he understood this was not a brain chemistry problem. He wrote, I can see a time when men will see themselves as greater than kings and less than men. Not or, and. And so he saw a time when we would oscillate back and forth. Because we are isolated and alone, we would oscillate back and forth between feeling ourselves to be above the world because nobody could touch us and feeling ourselves to be nobody because we had no links to any other human being. He predicted the madness of the modern age. And he said, there's only one resolution for this. And here I come back to the one, the few, and the many. The aristocrat, aristocratic age is over. We're not going to have people with authority. The only way we can build a world together that doesn't produce this manic depression, this extraordinary unhappiness that the youngest generation now is living through, the only way we can do, do this is through face-to-face -face relations. And that requires extraordinary work. He makes the distinction, and this is relevant to, to uh, observations Laura and a number of people made earlier, between the fact of democracy and the spirit of democracy. And already in 1835, he could see the problem. 
you can have the fact of democracy. He says in 1835, the Americans go to the polls once every four years, think themselves free, and fall back into servitude. The fact of voting doesn't mean you have a democratic regime. It is the spirit of democracy. And the spirit of democracy isn't just about going into the voting booth, as important as that is. The spirit of democracy can only be developed and sustained through these long-term face-to-face associations. My favorite passage in the book is this, and listen to the verbs. Feelings and ideas are renewed, the heart enlarged, and the mind expanded only by the reciprocal actions of citizens one upon another. Only through face-to-face relations, durable face-to-face relations, daily duties practiced, he calls it, can we build this robust world of mediating institutions that we must have in order to forestall the gentle servitude that he thought was coming at the end of history. Uh, He also says, and, and this is something all elites have to be thinking of, I praise democracy not for what it does, but for what it causes to be done. What it does is always a mess. If you're a member of the elite, you're gonna look at the people and say, they're coarse, that's the exact word he uses. They're not capable of democracy. And he says, you're right, they make a thousand mistakes. But it unleashes an energy never before seen in human civilization. That's what he says. So as elites, we have to understand that Yes, local people, I live out in the country, local government is a catastrophe, of course it is, but the biggest problem you must address in the modern age is that people are collapsing into themselves, withdrawing into themselves. You have to bring them out out of themselves, and the only way to do that is through mediating institutions. I will stop with that. Thank you very much. It is so thrilling to be here. Um, I worked on Tocqueville even longer than Josh. And finally, to be in the library, to see the place where those books were written, and to just get some sense of the excitement that he must have felt as he was reading them. It's just, it's so marvelous. And so I thank um, uh, ISI, I thank the Tocqueville Foundation, I I thank the Tocqueville family for their hospitality and generosity. Um, And I'm so happy to be able to talk about their ancestor. Uh, One of the things that Tocqueville wrote in a letter was that he was a liberal of a different kind. And that's part, I think, of what Josh was getting at, the mediating institutions that uh, we place between ourselves and the state. Um, uh, I would like to suggest three ways in which Tocqueville is a liberal of a different kind. Uh, The first came from his experience in America, and that was to see the positive relationship between religion and politics, or between church and state. A church and state that were separate, disestablished, but nonetheless vital. In fact, more vital for having been disestablished. I think one of the fundamental things about Tocqueville's liberalism, as compared with both Rousseau and Montesquieu, the two philosophers, along with Pascal, whom he said he read every day. And both Montesquieu and Rousseau were philosophic materialists. That is, they believed that human beings were basically matter. Um, and that they had, Rousseau may talk about the soul, but he, there is not really a soul. And I think we heard some of this from the uh, president of the college in Ukraine who spoke to us remotely earlier when he talked about something worth dying for, that, you, that we as human beings have bodies and souls. And this concern with immortality was something that Tocqueville took very seriously. He thought it was what made us human. 
We knew that we would die. We were searching for some kind of immortality. And he thought that the good thing about almost every religion is that it, it reminded us of this desire for immortality in one form or another. He has a famous passage in Democracy in America where he says, it's better to think that you'll be reincarnated as a pig than to think you're just going into the ground and that's the end of it. Uh, that the desire for immortality is the spur to human greatness. And greatness, again, this is something that liberalism was not, especially in its early days, concerned with. If you look at Thomas Hobbes, if you look at John Locke, the English uh, liberals, the English philosophers, the fear of violent death, the desire for material comfort and preservation, but nothing of grandeur in there. In fact, it was Hobbes's whole effort to try to stomp out pride, the Leviathan erected to tame the children of pride. Tocqueville wished to rediscover pride, not in a malignant form, but in a positive and healthy form. And so he was concerned with the question of greatness. What does greatness mean in democracy? We can look at this marvelous chateau and say there aren't too many of them uh, in democracy, even when people become wealthy. They don't build such beautiful things. And Tocqueville always is distinguishing between uh, democratic instincts and aristocratic instincts. So one of the great questions for him was, how do we promote greatness in a democratic form of government? And I won't go through all of the uh, ways that he um, uh, considered, but I'll mention two. Um, uh, and the first is something I've just finished writing on, so I'm particularly happy to share it with you. And that is the Tocqueville at the, and this is for the young people in the audience. Uh, when Tocqueville was 34 years old, he was elected to the legislature. And he was immediately appointed a rapporteur uh, to write a report on the emancipation of slaves in the French Caribbean colonies. And the report that he wrote is just simply thrilling to read, to see all of the things that he had to consider. He also had to consider the galling fact that the British had already done it. And they, the French, were the leaders of freedom and equality in the world. And those Brits had beaten them to it. And so he's aware of that, and he says he wants to learn from that experience. It's a marvelous report, uh, but it failed, as did the second um, effort at emancipation during the July monarchy. Uh, emancipation did not come until the revolution of 1848, uh, but Tocqueville certainly celebrated that. So there are opportunities for human greatness. And of course, another opportunity for human greatness is war. Uh, war brings out um, the desire to fight for something larger than yourself, something that is more compelling. It's a reason for sacrifice as um, uh, members of uh, uh, participants on this stage earlier today talked about the importance of being in Normandy and being reminded of something that is greater than ourselves. So Tocqueville, one aspect of his concern with um, democracy was whether it could rise to promote a certain kind of democratic greatness. Uh, war was certainly that possibility, and last night when I was looking over um, a terrific book on Tocqueville in England, I came across a quotation quite by accident um, that I thought would be worth sharing with you, which was Tocqueville in, ta and this is during the Crimean War, and talking about the need to contain Russia, and he said, 
we have to have Poland and Turkey. Uh, the Turks and the Poles have to be the Maginot line, but a, a good one, uh, a successful um, a, a, a line to stand, well, the Maginot lines. Uh, um, it has to be a, 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 a bulwark against Russian expansion. So he thought a lot about war, but in the second book, uh, of Democracy in America, to which uh, Josh um, alluded and uh, referred, uh, he also talked in the fourth uh, uh, and concluding uh, book of the second volume. And this is addressed not just to Americans. One of the principal differences between the two books is that in book one, Tocqueville was trying to explain how a, what the Republican Constitution of the United States was. In book two, he was thinking more about general problems of democracy. And if you will, if you read it, you see that many of the chapter titles don't mention America. They talk about democracy. And there is one chapter in particular called The Kind of Despotism That Democratic Nations Have to Fear. This is a famous chapter, and Josh rightly alluded to it when he said that there is a kind of democratic despotism that makes us so dependent upon government, upon bureaucracies, that we no longer do anything for ourselves. We are willing to give up. We are isolated, we are individual, we are alone, and therefore we feel so helpless that we turn to government. And government takes over more and more functions of our lives. And Tocqueville warns and says one of the great dangers is that we think that the sovereign is out to do good for us and therefore we trust the sovereign and expand the sovereign's power. But in the, in the end, we wind up diminishing ourselves because we've given away that human capacity to act and to uh, be a vital force in our lives and in the lives of the people around us. And so he was very worried about the tendencies that lead to this sort of democratic despotism. And he called them centralizing tendencies, and he talked about them in the chapters leading up to his great description of this benign uh, tyrant that just infantilizes us. It doesn't tyrannize over us in a physical way. It just nags at us. It takes over our lives. It tells us to put on our seatbelts and wear our bicycle helmets and not to eat the, the container that the pretzels come in on the plane and other useful bits of information. Uh, and so Tocqueville worried about this and he saw that war one of the downsides of war, war can be a theater of great sacrifice and grandeur, uh, but it also leads to centralizing tendencies. Um, we saw this with World War I, we saw it with World War II, certainly in the United States with the presidency of Franklin Delano Roosevelt where we first had uh, a welfare state put in place. Uh, we saw it with the war on terror, which led to the Department of Homeland Security and to the uh, modern surveillance state uh, arising out of the Patriot Act. And so all of these centralizing tendencies Tocqueville very much worried about. And I would say, so those are, he was concerned with greatness he, and he was um, concerned with religion, with the body as well as the soul. Uh, and he was above all, and he wrote himself, uh, of himself, described himself as his primary passion being the love of freedom. That democracies would put us, um, would give us both equality and freedom and that it would be up to us whether we would choose a depraved equality, a 
uh, an equality that is really based on democratic envy, that we see someone who has more than we do and we want to tear them down and take it away from them? Or do we want an equality that recognizes people, recognizes their accomplishments and achievements? And he was led, and it was so meaningful to be in the library, because he was led at the end of uh, the old regime, which was written in 1856, only three years before he died. And it reflects his sadness at the um, overthrow of the Second Republic and the coming of the Second Empire. And it caused him to withdraw from political life, which was his, which was what he really lived for. And he said, freedom is my great passion. And so he was led in um, the old revolution to reflect upon freedom. And if you don't mind, he can say it better than I can, so I'd like to just read you a short passage. Um, uh, I, I took a picture of it, so I have to squint a little here. I have often wondered where the source of the passion for political freedom which in all comes from, which in all times has made men do the greatest things that humanity has accomplished, in which, in which feelings it is rooted and nourishes itself. I see clearly that when nations are badly led, they are really, they are readily uh, conceive the desire to govern themselves. But this is, a, this is a kind of love of independence, which takes rise only from some particular and fleeting problems, which are brought on by despotism. It is never durable. It passes with the accident to which it gave birth. They seem, they seem to love freedom, but one finds that they only hated the master. Peoples who are made for freedom, uh, 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 what peoples who are made for freedom hate is the evil of subjection itself. I also do not think that the true love of liberty was ever born just from the desire for material goods that freedom produces. For this often succeeds in hiding it. It is certainly true that in the long run, freedom always brings um, uh, success and wealth, but it also at other times causes people to sacrifice the very material uh, uh, comforts that they have uh, won for themselves. That which in all times has so strongly attached certain men's hearts to freedom is its own attraction, its own peculiar charm, independent of its benefits. It is the pleasure of being able to speak, to act, to breathe without constraint under the government of God and the laws alone. Whoever seeks for anything else from freedom but itself is made for slavery. And he says, I don't know where this comes from, where this love of freedom comes from. It sounds so much as if he's talking about grace. It comes unbidden, unasked for, almost unmerited. But some people love it, and Tocqueville was one of them, and I think that is the greatest inspiration that he can give us. Thank you. Bien, vous vous demandez sans doute, comme je me demande ce que je fais dans ce panel, euh, je suis un industriel, donc euh, être un spécialiste de Tog, après deux grands spécialistes de Tocqueville, c'est un peu l'enjeu, c'est une idée de Jean-Guillaume, c'est pas la mienne, de dire, et, et que la, to, quand, à laquelle j'ai souscrit, mais que dans la mesure où, 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 où Tocqueville parle des corps intermédiaires, ce qu'on appellerait aujourd'hui la société civile, d'être un peu le, un représentant de, de la société civile pour réagir par rapport à, 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 à ses propos. Et je dois dire que, euh, indépendant de ça, en, en tant que, que citoyen, euh, Tocqueville m'a accompagné à plusieurs euh, moments de ma vie. C'est vraiment, au-delà, bien sûr, de la, 
de la partie prophétique et visionnaire que tout le monde a à l'esprit. Moi, ce qui me frappe de, c'est dans la singularité de, de l'œuvre de Tocqueville, c'est qu'elle est construite à partir du terrain. Alors, pour un, pour un industriel, c'est quelque chose d'important. Et donc, des observations de terrain extrêmement précises et, et construites en dehors de tout système. Et donc, en fait, je trouve que ce qui est formidable dans Tocqueville, c'est qu'il ne nous dit pas ce qu'il faut penser, mais il nous aide à voir. Euh, il nous aide à voir, il nous éclaire. Euh, et et c'est en ça qu'il est devenu euh, intemporel. Alors, euh, une fois que j'ai dit ça, euh, je voudrais rebondir sur ce qu'a dit euh, Joss, qui est sur, euh, sur le, le sujet... Euh, euh, un peu le sujet d'aujourd'hui, qui est la, la, la démocratie euh, mais, euh, et les périls de la démocratie, sachant que je ne vais pas parler des périls extérieurs qui ont été l'essentiel de la journée, mais plutôt du, du péril intérieur euh, qui est euh, la montée de, de, des populismes euh, qui vient de l'individualisme. Et face à ça, euh, Tocqueville y prône l'éducation euh, et... Euh, des citoyens et le renforcement des corps euh, euh, intermédiaires. Alors, il ne parle pas beaucoup de l'entreprise. Il faut dire que l'entreprise n'existe... Dans ses corps intermédiaires, il faut dire que l'entreprise, au XIXe siècle, elle commençait. Il parle, ceci dit, un, un, un petit peu déjà de l'industrie, et en disant que l'industrialisation va être facteur d'aggravation de, forte des, des inégalités. Euh, et il se prononce pour l'association Capital Travail, ce qui est peut-être une préscience de, de nos débats euh, aujourd'hui sur la valeur ajoutée, en tout cas les débats qu'on a en France, donc il y a une certaine actualité. J'ai oublié de dire que dans, mon, dans, mon, dans mes, euh, ma connaissance de Tocqueville, euh, à plusieurs moments de ma vie, j'ai... Elle a été renouvelée grâce à, grâce à Nicolas euh, et, et, et son ouvrage qui est très, euh, qui est très, euh, très accessible et très, et très éclairant. Alors aujourd'hui, je pense que si on dit qu'il nous aide à voir, il regarderait la société comment, il verrait que euh, dans euh, les corps intermédiaires, l'entreprise joue un rôle très important, ce qui n'était probablement pas évident au XIXe siècle. Et je pense qu'il s'appuierait sur des opérations de terrain et aujourd'hui, qu'est-ce que disent les observations de terrain Elles disent des choses qui sont à la fois assez négatives euh, d'une manière générale sur les institutions et dans ce, dans ce côté négatif qui sont relativement positifs pour l'entreprise. Qu'est-ce que disent les baromètres Je me réfère à toute une série de sondages, dont par exemple un, un baromètre qui a été fait récemment pour euh, l'Institut de l'entreprise, disent qu'on est dans un, milieu de, un climat de défiance très fort qui s'est accéléré. Je parle en France, mais je pense que c'est vrai dans beaucoup de pays et aux états unis Et que dans ce climat de défiance où toutes les institutions euh, sont euh, mal vues, l'entreprise apparaît aujourd'hui comme une, un peu une valeur, une, une, un refuge, une valeur refuge dans laquelle les, les citoyens ont tendance à considérer qu'elle peut euh, les aider, qu'elle joue un rôle dans la société utile. Euh, » Ce sondage, il, 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 quand on dit qu'est-ce qui peut le plus aider euh, euh, les gens qui ont bah, plus d'impact sur la vie, la première chose, qui, le, la première, c'est les citoyens eux-mêmes, ce qui montre l'importance de l'individualisme, c'est bon et c'est mauvais. Le deuxième, c'est les soignants et le troisième, c'est l'entreprise. Bien avant, euh, et malheureusement c'est dommage, toutes les institutions politiques, les, élus, les élus locaux, les élus nationaux, les syndicalistes, les cultes, euh, donc l'entreprise est vécue comme, comme, euh, comme quelque chose qui peut aider. Bon. Donc, du coup, ça le donne à l'entreprise une certaine responsabilité. Et c'est ça qui me, qui me paraît euh, 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 important. Moi, je suis depuis longtemps euh, euh, partisan dans un débat qui a fait fureur aux États-Unis pendant 30 ans, qui, je pense, est en train d'évoluer aux États-Unis, qui, en France, a été tranché, qui est le débat entre, entre les Friedmaniens, donc l'entreprise le, est là pour uniquement s'occuper de ses actionnaires, ou, le, ou, le, ou, le, ou les, la théorie des stakeholders, hein, qui en France, c'est un peu ce qui a conduit à, à la notion de capitalisme responsable et à la, à la, à la, ou à la responsabilité sociale euh, et, et environnementale des entreprises, je pense que Tocqueville serait clairement dans ce camp-là aujourd'hui. Donc l'entreprise, ça veut dire que du coup, elle a, des, euh, elle a des devoirs, mais elle peut jouer un rôle. Alors, comment elle peut jouer un rôle elle est confrontée au même individualisme. Mais je pense que l'entreprise est aussi un endroit où c'est peut-être plus facile de, de combattre l'individualisme. Parce que d'abord, le travail euh, est un lieu d'épanouissement. 
on, le, on a tendance à, à l'oublier en France aujourd'hui, mais je pense que euh, c'est fondamental. Et le travail en commun, alors moi, je, vous aurez compris à travers ça que je ne suis pas un grand fanat du télétravail. Je pense que le travail est remis, est remis, en, est re, est remis en cause, mais fondamentalement, l'entreprise, c'est un lieu où on fait les choses ensemble euh, et, et les choses concrètes. Et ça, je pense que par rapport à cette notion d'individualisme, ça a une grande valeur. C'est un lieu d'un « je pense ». Alors peut-être que j'ai une vision idéaliste, mais c'est un, un lieu d'un dialogue social aussi qui, je, peux être, qui, je pense, est plus apaisé euh, que ce qu'il est ailleurs. Hein. Euh, si je vois ce qui s'est passé en France depuis deux ans, c'est quand même un endroit où on discute, où on dialogue mieux qu'on arrive à le faire dans la politique. Donc je pense que l'entreprise le, peut avoir un rôle euh, important euh, de ce point de vue-là. Il faut que l'entreprise se comporte comme un bon citoyen. Donc soit responsable, ça veut dire une politique vis-à-vis -vis de ses salariés qui encourage ça, qui soit responsable, qui soit euh, aussi euh, reconnaissante des, des diversités, des plus inclusives. Il faut que, euh, il faut que dans le domaine environ, environnemental, et ça euh, Patrick Pouyanné en a parlé, on soit à la fois responsable mais lucide, il faut que l'entreprise, euh, et je crois que c'est important, moi j'avais pris euh, avec un certain nombre d'autres entreprises en France il y a une, une dizaine d'années, l'engagement d'aider... Euh, les, ceux qui, les, les cadres de l'entreprise qui veulent aller en politique, si jamais ça ne se passe pas bien, à les reprendre. Je pense qu'on a un gros sujet, je crois que c'est le même sujet aux états unis qu'en Europe, de, euh, et, et, et par, par rapport à nos autres institutions intermédiaires, on a un gros sujet de, de, du niveau des gens qui vont en politique, parce que c'est difficile, et que, et que ça baisse tous les ans, hein, et donc si l'entreprise peut essayer et aider à faciliter ça, je crois que c'est un rôle à Important. Donc l'entreprise a un rôle utile. Mais simplement, euh, dans ce, ce rôle de corps intermédiaire, je pense qu'il a aussi ses limites. Et l'entreprise doit faire très attention. Si je pense que euh, et les chefs d'entreprise sont légitimes à, à prendre part dans le débat public... Euh, Patrick Pouyanné l'a fait de façon remarquable euh, tout à l'heure sur toute une série euh, de sujets, alors qui concerne son entreprise, mais il a été bien au-delà. Je pense que euh, sur beaucoup de sujets, et notamment... Euh, tout ce qui est lié à, à la politique économique, parce que ça, c'est des sujets sur lesquels on est légitime, les entreprises doivent être, faire très attention de ne pas sortir non plus de leur cadre et d'aller sur des domaines qui sont plus uniquement politiques. Et là, euh, alors là il y a une différence d'approche entre l'Europe le, le, et les États-Unis. Chez Saint-Gobain, nous avons comme règle, nous interdisons de financer tout parti politique et nous faisons très attention de ne pas prendre des positions sur des débats qui pourraient être, être uniquement de nature politique et donc clivants. Et aux états unis d'ailleurs, où ce n'est pas exactement le cas, on voit les limites, j'allais dire, de, de cette position. Je prends l'exemple qui, enfin, qui, qui interpelle beaucoup ici en Europe de ce qui s'est passé avec Disney, où on est pris à la fois entre critiquer à gauche et à droite et donc il y a un effet boomerang euh, positif. Donc je pense que c'est aussi les limites. Mais... Malgré ses limites, je pense qu'aujourd'hui, l'entreprise peut jouer un rôle dans l'atténuation de l'individualisme et donc aider à solidifier nos démocraties. C'est peut-être une vision idéale, je le dis avec humilité, mais je pense que tout ce qui peut être, tous les corps intermédiaires qui peuvent jouer, comme le souhaitait Tocqueville, un rôle pour réduire cet individualisme, ce sont les bienvenus. Et voilà, c'est la contribution que je pense que l'entreprise peut apporter aujourd'hui. I, I want to hand this over to the students in one second, but I have to say something about my new best friend, Pierre. Because um, he said some very important things that uh, c conservatives in America don't fully understand. You have to remember that since the Reagan years, uh, America has been consumed by the idea that market efficiency is the only thing that matters. <coughs> Now, I will say that whether you like Trump or not, Uh, there has been rethinking on the right now as a consequence of that. And Tocqueville saw this problem already in the 1830s. Why does he focus on commerce? Because he believes that the great crisis of the modern age is what he calls middle class anxiety. When everybody's social class is disappearing, people are always worried about falling. And commerce is important to give them some security to, uh, to atone or to, to reduce their uh, anxieties. Tocqueville's big worry, and this comes to the question of what corporate responsibility is today, his big worry, which, by the way, he saw 10 years before Karl Marx wrote about it in the French Revolution. He thought that the great temptation of the democratic age would be to 
uh, fix on one unit of value. <clears throat> he says in one place, in the democratic age, unity becomes an obsession. And one way in which unity becomes an obsession is that we will focus exclusively on money. Money becomes the universal measure of all things. He did say that the aristocratic Europe understood that, no, that's not quite right. He worried that eventually it moved that direction. But conservatives who, who supported the Reagan free market uh, as the measure of all things move in the 1980s are now turning back and reading Tocqueville and realizing money cannot be the only measure. Here's the great question we have to ask. I'm very serious about this one. Do we live in a market or do we go to a market? If we live in a market, everything is reducible to money, monetary value. If we go to a market, we recognize that money matters, but there are other things that are of value. And it strikes me that corporations, I might not be fully in agreement with ESG, but it strikes me that corporations are now pulling back, they have been the last decade or so, and realizing, wait, money can't be the only measure. All right, let's open it up for questions here uh, from the students, uh, especially, but not only from the students. Yeah, you go. You go. <laughs> Um, right, thank you. I don't know if I should do the question in French given that I wanted to uh, do it in French. Um, je me suis uh, mis à penser sur uh, la question des, des cadres des entreprises qui veulent partir, uh, faire de la politique et après retourner. Et dans le contexte de, côté de Tocqueville, je pense que ça, ça détruit un peu le le rôle de la société civile et des, et des corps médiateurs. Et je voulais un peu te demander comment on pourrait faire ça, pas d'un côté académique ou d'un côté intellectuel, mais d'un côté purement euh, gérantiel, de, 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 du côté du business. Puisque on a, en Amérique latine, on a un problème vraiment très similaire, mais ça, ça a fait que... Ça a ça fait que la plupart des politiques, ils deviennent des, des businessmen de la politique au, au lieu de vraiment être des politiciens, des, des, des gens d'affaires ou des gens d'État. Alors je voulais un peu demander comment est-ce que ça pourrait fonctionner pour bien séparer les deux et pour avoir une société civile forte et un État efficient. Oui, moi, mon, mon point de départ, c'est que euh, Tocqueville, il faut que les citoyens s'intéressent euh, au bien commun, s'intéressent et donc à la chose politique plus. Bon. Et, et ce qu'on voit dans la montée de, des populismes, c'est aussi qu'il y a un désintérêt de beaucoup de gens pour la politique. Et qu'aujourd'hui, un homme politique, c'est beaucoup plus dur d'être un homme politique ou une femme politique que ça n'était il y a 20 ans. Voilà. Je ne dis pas du tout que tous les, les, euh, les responsables, les politiques doivent venir du milieu de l'entreprise. Ce n'est pas ça que je dis. Je dis simplement que dans la mesure où la, où la, la, la politique, c'est difficile, euh, et, et euh, alors autrefois, en plus, il y avait en France, on pouvait faire des carrières politiques. Hein. Euh, Aujourd'hui, c'est beaucoup plus difficile avec tout ce qui est lié à la, à, aux, aux règles en France sur le cumul des mandats. Hein donc ça veut dire que du coup la vie politique elle peut être euh, euh, éphémère et donc euh, euh, s'il si peut y avoir une, une crainte de s'engager en politique en disant bah, si je suis battu aux élections euh, cinq ans après qu'est-ce que je fais c'est un peu ça l'idée c'est de dire euh, d'offrir une sorte d'élastique de, de, de retour c'est une toute petite euh, idée hein, mais c'est juste l'idée de dire euh, 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 il faut qu'il y ait plus euh, de citoyens euh, éduqués euh, qui s'intéressent à la chose publique et à la politique. Voilà, C'était ça mon, mon point de départ, qui était un sujet en France. Hein. Je constatais aussi en France, alors ça a pas mal changé depuis quelques années, c'est que quand on était à l'Assemblée nationale ou enfin, au, au Parlement, le, le nombre de parlementaires euh, jusqu'en 2015, euh, enfin 2017 même, 2010, qui, qui venait du milieu de l'entreprise, c'était moins de 5%. Ça a beaucoup changé, hein, mais c'était très très faible. Et donc ça, ça me paraissait non plus pas forcément une bonne idée. Voilà, c'était un esprit que j'avais avec quelques, quelques autres euh, patrons euh, euh, engagés dans cette direction, qui a donné de bons résultats. Hein, dans, chez Saint-Gobain, on, on en a un certain nombre. Alors c'est de des élus locaux en général. Hein, mais mais je, je, je pense que c'était une toute petite contribution, mais je... 
euh, voilà, que je, je, qui me paraissait intéressante par rapport au débat d'aujourd'hui. At the end of uh, volume one of Democracy America, Tocqueville makes a famous comparison between Russia and the United States with respect to equality. And uh, in the similar section, he remarks on the dangers of prolonged war for the prospects of democratic freedom. Could you remark on what talk Tocqueville's talking about here? Uh, yes. Uh, one of the things that he talks about with war and democracies he, is that Democrats are very impatient. It's part of their DNA. Uh, they don't have the they don't have the capacity for sustained attention uh, and for lo long wars. Uh, he thinks that that real they have to be resolved quickly or the people will move on. We've seen that in our own. Uh, in our own times with the various wars with which the West and the United States has been engaged. So it's fundamentally a question of uh, impatience. And he says earlier in volume one that the best foreign policy is conducted in a democracy but by an aristocracy. Now, whether even that combination is a stable one is open to some consideration. Uh, if you talk about not so much aristocracy, but just the most educated people and how they can bring along people for a sustained endeavor. You can think about de Gaulle in World War II, you can think about Churchill, you can think about uh, uh, FDR, but that war only lasted four years. Uh, the wars with which you young people have grown up have lasted much longer and have had very um, inconclusive results. And so that is a problem in a democracy. L let me add, the art of statesmanship is to take the next step. Now that's a famous saying by Michael Oakeshott, an English conservative of mid 20th century, but it's, it's profoundly important that we bear this in mind. One of the geniuses of Tocqueville was that he thinks in this way, on the one hand, on the other hand. And anyone who's involved in politics, which is the difficult art of finding compromise, should not be ideologically pure. So his worry is the following, as Gene said, War can lead to national renewal. Even Kant said this in Perpetual Peace. But on the other hand, one of the consequences of war is that we will always concentrate power uh, in the hands of the state. And his worry at the end of democracy in America was that we would live in a kinder, gentler despotism uh, at the end of history where the state has grown so large that all the mediating institutions and their functions have been absorbed by the state. So. There is no in principle answer, and this is, this is Tocqueville's liberalism. On the left, there's a pure answer. On the right, there's a pure answer. Let us keep going forward and destroy what's here because it's poisonous. Let us go back and re-enchant the world. Those are easy answers which provide, and this is a word that I have come to think is central to Tocqueville's thinking. They provide parsimony where everything fits together. And he said the burden, the burden of life in the democratic age is to live without parsimony. That's why we have the Tocqueville conversations where we bring people together who disagree. So let us arrive at a provisional answer. Uh, the whole idea of free markets is we don't know the pure answer to things. Let's arrive at a provisional answer and maybe Microsoft will win one year and, and, and some other company will win another year. And that's why we have periodic elections. We have to recognize that life is not pure and life does not fit. Let me add one other thing to Hugo's question. We've talked a lot about policy, but deeper than policy are habits. And unless you have the right habits, no policy can fit. You're asking the question, can there be a political domain that's not corrupted? And that's why I said, uh, do we live in a market or go to a market? It's really a profound question. Do we recognize the plurality of domains of life? That you don't evaluate your family and your loves in terms of money. 
You have religious associations which aren't, which aren't the same as your family or the same as your corporations. And what Tocqueville thought, and very few people really grasp this, is that it's in these mediating institutions that we learn that life doesn't fit. And we have to have the courage to recognize that life doesn't fit. It's a long struggle in history to avoid the twin temptations of revolution and reenchantment. And the Russians are promising a reenchanted world. This is the latest movement of reenchantment that liberals have to fight. And this will go on for centuries. The Jean only Guillaume. thing I would say is that reenchantment sounds too alluring. 